Uh, so uh, I have a number of things that I, I want to say and, and ask you in, in light of uh, and, and see if I can get your comments on them so that we can think through these issues a bit further. Uh, in your article, an article that appears on your website called Adonai and Adoni, which is an article on Psalm 110, you say something similar to what you just said a moment ago. You say Psalm 110 is, one is the Bible's master text for defining the Son of God in relation to the one God, uh, his Father. And similarly, in your talk, you, you mentioned master text. You also referred to it along with Deuteronomy 6.4, the famous Shema of Israel, as uh, the uh, constitution of Israel. And in light of that, you said that uh, one can't interpret either the Old Testament or what Jesus or Paul and others said in the New Testament in a Trinitarian way. In fact, you said that uh, Jesus and Paul wouldn't even understand uh, later uh, Trinitarian terminology. And, and though I would point out to you that I don't think they knew the terms unitary monotheistic Jew either or single divine person. None of those terms appear uh, in the Bible, uh, though they do appear in your talk and in, in your writings. But uh, on Psalm 110, I, I want to ask a question, and, and along the way, I just want to observe that I, I think there's a fundamental methodological problem when you make a text of Scripture a, a master text. Now, I'm not objecting here to the idea that certain texts, like Psalm 110, 1, are important texts. I, I certainly think that it, it's an important text, as well as Deuteronomy 6, as well as Mark 12, when Jesus quotes the Shema. But, but the problem is that if we get an interpretation of a particular text wrong, and then we use that text as a master text, making every other text submit to it, then the problem is it ends up writing roughshod over all of these other passages, and so uh, skews everything that we're, we're thinking, and we're not allowing the Bible uh, to speak to us in a harmonious, consistent, coherent way. And so I, I do have something of a, a disagreement there methodologically, but, but let's just get right to the, the issue in terms of Psalm 110.1. I'm curious uh, how you deal with Psalm 110 in, in a consistent way in light of your uh, interpretation of verse 5. Now, now first, let me just say, uh, you, you've already granted, I think, and you, you've opened the door to the possibility that uh, Adoni in Psalm 110.1 may well have been pointed incorrectly by the Masoretes, as in fact they did uh, point things differently on occasion uh, than obviously the Septuagint took it, which the New Testament writers often quote over against the Masoretic vowel pointing. Uh, but more than that, you even admitted in Psalm 110 verse 5 that the Sophorim rendered, rendered uh, Yahweh as Adonai, which shows that the Masoretes and so forth uh, were not above uh, making some of these uh, differences, though we can detect them, thankfully, uh, which doesn't therefore jeopardize our confidence in the revelation of the biblical text. But you said that, uh, uh, let's just run with the Masoretic rendering of Adoni, which you said can only refer to a man. And I, I disagree with that. I think Adoni is used for God in Genesis 18 and other passages. But uh, and it's also found in certain Theophoric names, by the way, such as Adonijah, which is Adoni plus Yah, which means Yahweh is my uh, Lord. Uh, but listen to Psalm 1, 5, uh, 110, verse 5, and the rest of the psalm, in light of your interpretation, this is what I'd like you to comment on first. Verse 5, it says, Adonai is at your right hand. You said this is Adonai. This refers to Yahweh. It doesn't refer to the Messiah. So Adonai is at your right hand. He, the pronoun referring back to Adonai, he will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He, referring back to Adonai, will judge among the nations. He, referring back to Adonai, will fill them with corpses. He, referring back to Adonai, will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He, referring back to Adonai, will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. My question to you is, in light of the full context, if Adonai here is a reference to the Father, why does he sound so much like the Messiah raising his head after the victory over apostate and uh, ungodly kings? Of course, that's an excellent question. First of all, I concede entirely the word is Adonai. Uh, some of the text read Yahweh, and that makes no difference at all whether you say Yahweh or Adonai. And yes, the reversal is quite deliberate. I put it to you this way. You're neglecting 446 evidently correct distinctions in Adonai and Adonai, and you're hinting then that somehow they got the pointing wrong in verse 1. That's not fair. When you have 446 samples of correct pointing, Without any evidence of an incorrect pointing, I don't think you're raising a fair point. Of course, the Messiah and Yahweh operate as one. We know that. And so it's perfectly fine for them to blend together 
from verse 5 onwards. And yes, I think it's certainly the Messiah who raises his head. I get that. But you'll find that blending of pronouns as between God and Messiah in a number of passages. It doesn't offset the plain recognition that in other passages, even Psalm 109, 109 rather, and other places in the Psalms, one in Isaiah, you can have Adonai at your right hand. It's a very clear perception of a different picture. Much of commentary recognizes that. So that's not enough then to destroy the obvious fact that in verse 1, Adonai is the non-deity title. And let me simply add this, that in Genesis 18, I don't know what verse you're referring to there. Where in Genesis 18 are you finding Adonai? Uh, no, not Adonai, Adoni, used in reference to Yahweh. When the three men appear to Abraham in Genesis 18, Abraham addresses uh, them or one of them as Adoni. I must interrupt you. Are you reading the Hebrew text there? Uh, I have the Hebrew text right here. I'm saying that from memory, but this is my copy of the Hebrew text, uh, and it very clearly does use Adoni there. Uh, but let, let's go back to Psalm 110 one real quickly. Yeah, but that's right, and we must get the facts right here. I want somebody to confirm for me what is the Hebrew word there in 18, 18 what verse? Three. What verse? Uh, three. 18 what verse, please? Okay, let me, uh, I'm going to have to pull it up. And while I do so, uh, let me just say that I, I think that Aunt Mr. Buzzard, Sir Buzzard, uh, has tacitly conceded the point that Psalm 110, verse 5, in context, is referring to Messiah as Adonai. Now, I, I think that he's, he's trying to weasel out of it here by saying they're sort of blended together. But, of course, the readers of Psalm 110 aren't uh, looking for this artifice. They're not looking for a way to try and make Psalm 110 uh, say something that later Unitarians came to believe. And, by the way, I fundamentally disagree with the idea that... Uh, uh, the ancient Jews, I'm not talking here about later post-Christian unbelieving Jews, but I fundamentally disagree with the idea that uh, ancient Jews were Unitarians. They certainly want, weren't. But uh, get the text here it is, Genesis 18, 3, uh, very clearly says Adoni, Vayomer Adoni, Im, and so on, uh, and said, my Lord. Uh, so the Masoretic text, in fact, here is using Adoni for Yahweh. Uh, but I, I, I'm not even, uh, I'm not necessarily interested in sticking on that point. My point is simply that it's incorrect to say the term Adonai is, is never used for a man. But I'm happy to concede, contrary to fact, that Adonai refers to a man in Psalm 110. So if we grant that the Masoretes are dealing uprightly here, we still have to reckon with Psalm 110 verse 5 in the context of the psalm without uh, appealing to uh, artificial, you know, maneuvers in order to get around it. In Psalm 110.5, Adonai, which in context, I recognize elsewhere the term can be used for Yahweh at the right hand of someone, uh, but here in context, it's already said in verse 1 that the one who's at the right hand is Adonai. So when just four verses later, it says that Adonai is at his right hand, it most naturally refers to the one being spoken of in verse 1 as Adonai. Uh, but then when you go through the psalm, it's even further confirmed. Adonai lifts up his head and drinks from a brook from beside the way, which is a clearly human function and therefore very clearly refers to the Messiah. Uh, I, I don't think we're dealing honestly with the text there when that's what we do. But now, but now let me just bring in my other point here. This is why I say that it's so problematic to make a particular text a master text in the way that you've done. Because now we've got this ambiguity. Let me pretend that, that this is ambiguous now, that, it, that we don't know whether it's the Messiah or not. Uh, but now we've said that this text is a master text, and we're going to make it ride roughshod over the rest of Scripture. So when we turn to a passage like Isaiah 9, 6, where the Messiah is referred to as mighty God or the Father of eternity. No, 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 no. Psalm 110, 1 says Messiah is only a human Lord. Uh, or when we turn to a text like Psalm 45, uh, therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. No, 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 Psalm 110, 1 says that the, uh, the Messiah is only a human Lord. Or when Micah 5, 2 says that his origins are from of old, from the days of eternity. No, 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 Psalm 110, 1 says Messiah is only a human Lord. That's the problem that's created when we make a text like Psalm 110, 1, a master text, which, at the end of the day, I don't think even teaches what you're arguing. This is a master text. James Dunn, it runs like a golden thread. Statistically, it's quoted more than any other verse by far from the Old Testament. Therefore, it's a master text. 
Secondly, in John, in uh, Genesis 18.3, the Hebrew word is not Adonai. And this is not a mistake that commentators make, unfortunately. The word is Adonai. The one angel there is being addressed as Adonai. The word no. is not Adonai. No, no, no. Because that agent, that angel representing God, that's all. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But uh, allow me then to show you uh, a hard copy of the Hebrew text so that every Oh, that's very interesting. Maybe we're we're looking at two different uh, uh, translations here. Not translations, or, the original. Or renderings of the Hebrew. Well, rather than get bogged down, I'll I'll have to <laughs> see the point again, because my point isn't and doesn't hinge on uh, the text being Adoni rather than Adonai. Although I affirm that it uh, is. I'm sorry. Are you looking at something else uh, that might help us here, Mr. Buzzard or Sir Buzzard? Uh, we must get the facts right here. Yes, I, I agree, but... Uh, the word is not Adonai, the word is Adonai. And it's because one of the angels, one, not the all three, but one of the angels is singled out. That's very interesting because in John 20, 28, you can address Jesus as God and mean he's representing God. So I contend, however, that this is a master text because it's quoted more often than any other text. And when you get to the one sitting at the right hand of the Father, guess who it is? The Son of Man, the human being. This is massively important. Okay, again, you, I think you're missing my point. Uh, I brought up Genesis 18 as one example, and I still affirm that it's Adoni. Uh, and I'm going to have to figure out why you've got something different, but that's going to have to wait since I, I don't think we can uh, chase down the sources right now to uh, iron that out. But my point is that Psalm 110.1, even granting that it's Adoni, and even granting that the word Adoni can only be used to refer to someone who is a true human being, the fact of the matter is, in verse 5, the same person is being referred to at Yahweh's right hand as Adonai. So the Messiah is being referred to as both Adoni and Adonai in the same text, which is actually the entirety of the Christian doctrine of the person and natures of Christ, that he is one person with two natures, deity and humanity. When you try to deal with that, your only option was to say, well, it just confuses them later in the verse, but that's simply not going to do, especially when you're going to make this a master text. If this is going to be a master text, then we're going to have to say, that it has to be clear, otherwise you're using an ambiguous text in your particular choice, arbitrarily, of what's going to be the definitive interpretation of that to control your understanding of other texts. Uh, now, I'll let you comment on that, but I want to bring in another passage here. I don't want to uh, get lost on only one thing, and this is related, actually. Uh, you mentioned that Jesus in Mark 12, and there's a parallel in Matthew 22, that Jesus appeals to this passage uh, and that shows that Jesus was a Unitarian. Again, I, I disagree with the idea that Jews uh, prior to uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus and even contemporaneous with Jesus were in fact Unitarian monotheists. And uh, in, in response to that, let me just submit a couple of books to you for your consideration. This is from Dan Daniel Boyerin, an Orthodox Jew, uh, the professor of Talmudic culture uh, at the in the Department of Near Eastern Studies and Rhetoric at the University of California, Berkeley. In here, he argues that there were a contingent, in fact, the vast majority of pre-Christian Jews and Jews contemporaneous with Jesus who believed that there was more than one person in the Godhead. Uh, similarly, Alan Siegel, in his book, Two Powers in Heaven, uh, makes that point that the, the controversy actually continued on after the time of Jesus, though it became particularly pointed given that uh, it, it seemed to open the door of possibility to the Christian view. Uh, but so when we look at Mark 12, I don't think we can have that assumption in our minds. But notice what Jesus does in Mark 12 immediately after he quotes the Shema. Shema Yisrael, which is Yahweh Eloheinu, by the way, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Uh, when Jesus quotes that, immediately after that, we're told that he then quoted Psalm 110. Now, we, this is fundamentally important. We have to understand what, what's going on here. In Matthew 22, Matthew's account of this, he tells us that there were a series of questions that were being thrown at Jesus, first by the Sadducees and the Herodians and then by the Pharisees. And in each case, Jesus silences the opposition. They, they ask him a question, and then he answers them. But then, at the end of the passage, we're told that Jesus now has turned the tables on them by asking them now to deal with Psalm 110. And there, Jesus asked the question, how can Messiah 
B, the son of David, when David, speaking in the Psalms, refers to him as my Lord. If the term my Lord there simply refers to a human being, then there's no conundrum. There's nothing for the Pharisees to solve. Of course, David could refer to a human descendant of his as his Lord. Uh, there's no problem there. But what is a problem is the idea uh, that David, who is the king of Israel, could be referring to anyone as a divine person, as Lord. That's the conundrum in Mark 12, and that's why the Pharisees go away silenced and ashamed. I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yes, first of all, we, we need to get the facts right in Genesis 18.3. The Hebrew text reads, Adonai there. Secondly, you are overlooking, I suggest, 194 occurrences of Adonai, which plainly don't mean God. That's an extraordinary thing. Adonai occurs 195 times, and you have to concede that clearly Adonai is not God in 194 occurrences. However, we have checks and balances here. The Greek Septuagint is reflected in the New Testament, which you accept as scripture, and we have then tokirio mu, my lord, and tokirio mu translates my lord. So the Septuagint is correct. It doesn't translate ladonai. You can check it all, look at, look at all of them, and you'll see the distinction is clear. Ask any rabbi, too, about this. And I, I'm amazed, actually, that the facts are so difficult in, in, in Genesis 18.3, because the word there is not Adoni at all. Find me a single text in which Adoni refers to God, and I'm, I'll be listening. But I don't think you can find one. Okay. Uh, actually, I think you've hung yourself by, uh, and I don't mean that in any uh, nasty sense, but, but I think that you've uh, hung yourself by appealing to the Septuagint here. Not only because the Septuagint sometimes does render the phrase, my Lord, uh, in Greek, uh, which is Adonai in the Hebrew text as kurios mu or kurio mu uh, in the dative, uh, but Psalm 110 in the, in the Septuagint translation, actually in verse 3 says that God has begotten Adonai from before the light, from before the morning star. Oh yes it does, I have Sir Lancelot uh, Renton's translation right here, uh, I'll read it to you. Here's what the Greek text says, I'm sorry I'm not using the uh, modern pronunciation, uh, but it says, Ek gastros pro uh, hiosporu egenesa se. Here it says, I have begotten thee from before the morning, before the morning light. And so, uh, number one, the Septuagint does translate Adonai as kurios mu, and the Septuagint even, uh, besides the Hebrew text at Psalm 110.3 is, is actually very difficult. And this is how the Septuagint, the pre-Christian Jewish translators of the Septuagint, renders Psalm 110 verse 3, and, and, and therefore it renders it in a way that is incompatible with your particular version of Unitarianism, which denies that Jesus existed before his conception and birth. You're, you're not, I think, I'm fully aware of the Septuagint of Psalm 110 3, but you're telling me that I have begotten you means I have begotten Adonai, God? I'm telling you that this is but Psalm 110 in the yeah. Septuagint text, yeah. whatever questions we might want to ask, yeah. says that Adoni, which I believe is Adonai, sure, uh, but it says that he was begotten before the morning star. Whether that's something we like, whether that's something that's intelligible or sensible to us, the, the first thing you mentioned, we've got to get the facts straight. Yeah. Before we can reason about the facts, before we can ask questions about them, we mm. first have to have them down. Psalm 110 very clearly in the Septuagint, refers to Messiah as one who was begotten before the morning light. Before believe you believe that. Good. But it's not Adonai. It's, Adonai. Adonai. it's, Adonai. it's, Adon it's not Adonai there at all. It's not God being begotten. It's the Messiah. First of all, the continental text does not have Adonai. That's a later Masoretic edition. Secondly, I mean, if you've agreed that in the in Psalm 110, the Masoretes did not always deal uh, accurately with uh, the text, the continental text. Uh, so looking simply at the continental text, all it says uh, is, well, it says, Yahweh said to Adonai. That's the way it was read in the Christian church for centuries. That's even the way it was read by pre-Christian Jews. There's, there should be no dispute there. Uh, but what I have pointed out is even if we want to go that route, even if we want to say that later anti-Trinitarian Jews who rejected Jesus and so forth, even if we want to say that their interpretation reflected in the vowel pointing is authoritative and is infallible and so forth, then we still have to wrestle with Psalm 110 verse 5, where the same person at Yahweh's right hand is referred to as Adonai, and that person in the rest of the psalm is said to lift up his head at the uh, uh, 
at the end of the battle and refreshing himself, taking a drink from the water. Uh, I, I think that you keep going to Genesis 18, a passage that uh, I'll be happy to look up later or uh, even concede to you for this sake. Uh, I think you keep going back to that because the, the facts in Psalm 110 are quite difficult. I would be interested in, in your statement that, that Psalm 110.1 is being read as Yahweh spoke to Adonai in pre-Christian times. Show me. Because the Jews applied this to Hezekiah, to Job, to Abraham. It's simply uh, not a fact. Well, when are you showing me that Adonai was read as the second Lord in Psalm 1 in pre-Christian times? Where? Okay, a number of things. First of all, you just said, because the Jews are referring it to Hezekiah and to these other people. Yes. Now, uh, mutatis mutandis, I might throw that back at you and say, what Jews? Where? Pre-Christian Jews certainly weren't referring this to Hezekiah, and I challenge you to produce any pre-Christian Jew uh, who did. Uh, but the reason I pointed out to you these books is precisely because that's what these scholars are pointing out. These are both Jewish scholars. Jewish scholars making the point that prior to the coming of Jesus, prior to the spread of Christianity into uh, the world, the Jews read these texts as second Lord texts. And this discussion continues on into the Talmud. Okay, so that's not something I'm making up. These are the references. You can look at the books. Uh, again, we go back to Psalm 110, and the Septuagint is a clear witness to how the Jews were reading the verse. The Jews were not reading the verse as a reference to a person who would not come into existence until his conception in Bethlehem. The Jews read that this person at Yahweh's right hand, this person at Yahweh's right hand, actually uh, is referred to as Yahweh or Adonai in verse 5. This person is said to lift up his head uh, at the end of the battle. And this person was begotten before the morning light. Before God said, let there be light, this person was there. So, so, I mean, these are the path, these are the things that we have to deal with. And, and again, let me go back to my point. I think that it's a problem to make a text uh, that I think is clearly a reference to the deity of Messiah, but you think uh, that all that evidence can be uh, just swept aside. Uh, but then you make it the master text. Don't you see a, a problem there? I mean, I, I agree that this is an important text. We need to wrestle with this. We need to see who has the, the facts on their side. But uh, when you make it a master text and there are these questions, then it becomes a problem. Uh, and I don't think that it can uh, withstand the weight that you want to put on it in light of very other texts that are very clear, calling Messiah God. I made reference to Isaiah 9, 6, to Micah 5, 2, uh, Jeremiah referring to the coming Messiah as Yahweh, our righteousness. Uh, over and over again, the Old Testament anticipates a divine Messiah. And when we get to the New Testament witness, which I hope we can get to, we continue to hear this very thing concerning Jesus. John 1.1, 1, 1, Kai Theos ain Halagos, Jesus is referred to as God. John 1.18, Jesus is called Monogenes Theos, the one and only God. John 20.28, 20, Ha Kurios Mu Kai Ha Theos Mu, Jesus is referred to as my Lord and my God. By the way, a quote of Psalm 33 where uh, it uses Adonai for Lord my Lord and my God. Uh, and by the way, uh, since I mentioned that, allow me just to point out something. I, I'd love your response on this. I don't know that I've ever heard a uh, Unitarian response to it. Uh, you're familiar, I'm sure, with the Messianic Psalm, Psalm 68. In that uh, text, we read, the chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord, Adonai, is among them as at Sinai in holiness. When you ascended on high, you took many captives. So here in Psalm 68, it refers to the Lord, Adonai, ascending on high and taking captivity captive. That passage is actually quoted by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, only he applies it to the Lord Jesus. So Paul identifies the Lord, or Adonai, of, of Psalm 68. And remember, we can't uh, dismiss the, the Masoretes. That's what you said earlier. We can't say the Masoretes got the pointing wrong. And so if that's what we're doing, Psalm 68 refers to Adonai ascending on high. Paul takes the text, applies it to Jesus in Ephesians 4. So Jesus is identified as Adonai by Paul. We concede the point. There's nothing to argue about. There are many Yahweh texts that are applied to Jesus. All second coming. And Adonai, and Adonai text. Uh, yeah, Yahweh Adonai is the same thing. Makes no difference at all. Adonai is the subject for Yahweh. We know nobody's going to argue the point with you. All the second time it coming verses in the Old Testament are Yahweh Adonai texts. It's not quite clear. However, what you've not shown is that Genesis 18.3 is Adonai, and you stated it very clearly. It's not. Uh, okay. 
Okay, let me let me do this so that we can be done with uh, Genesis 18.3. I was absolutely wrong. The person Abraham addressed is uh, Adonai, not Adoni. Now we can go back to Psalm 110 and wrestle with the fact that Adoni in verse 1 is called Adonai in verse 5. Uh, then we can go to the fact that Psalm 68 refers to Adonai ascending on high, taking captivity captive, and, as you've conceded, that's applied to Jesus. In fact, you even gave us more verses when you admitted that all the second coming texts in the Old Testament that speak of Yahweh coming are all referred to the Lord Jesus. And, and by the way, that actually goes back to something you said earlier. I wrote it down here. You said that uh, uh, 1,300 times the word God in the New Testament is used for the Father, 99% of the time. Uh, but what you didn't reckon with is the fact that the term Lord, by far and away, is used for Jesus in the New Testament. And when you just look at, let's just take Paul's writings, since you like the, the statistics, uh, take Paul's writings. Uh, when Paul quotes the Old Testament, 45 of his Old Testament quotations that uh, contain the Hebrew word Yahweh, Okay. Of those 45 references to Yahweh, 75% of them are used for Jesus. So by far and away, the vast majority of times the word Yahweh is, occurs in the Hebrew text is used in the New Testament by Paul to refer to Jesus. And so I happily concede, the, the majority of the time, the, the Father is referred to as God, though not exclusively. But Jesus, the vast majority of time, is given the Tetragrammaton. And so if we're going to go by the number of occurrences, then uh, I, I think you've got a, a huge problem on your hands. Yeah, but what you've not told us, I must interrupt you, is that our Lord Jesus Christ is standard, not invariably, but talk about our Lord Jesus Christ. That's not Yahweh. I'm not sure what, you, what your argument was. I, very clear. Let me make the point. Our Lord Jesus Christ, which is standard, not invariably. I know he's called the Lord constantly, but he's very often called our Lord Jesus Christ, once my Lord, and that cannot be Yahweh. Uh, well, uh, I'm confused by that. Of course, uh, maybe Yahweh, you, maybe you can't say of Yahweh he is our Lord, uh, but everybody in my church can say that. Uh, and that's certainly true in no, the this Bible. This is the language point. This is the language point. Must get these things. I need to make it because I didn't. I didn't get it. Uh, it's a language hard. point. Our Yahweh is a linguistic impossibility. Therefore, you know that when uh, we're talking but, but, our Lord, we're talking the my Lord of Psalm 101. Our Lord, King David. My Lord. It's the messianic title, and you've obscured Luke 2:11, which tells us the birth certificate of this person. He's Messiah, Lord. That's not Yahweh. Okay, I understand your point now. The problem is you can say that in Greek, and that's how they did say it. They did they did use Yahweh in the in the Septuagint to refer to uh, him as our Lord. That's used. Uh, no, 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 not, our not our Yahweh. Never. Uh, well, okay. I, never. I don't take that point. Very important okay. point. I'll, I'll be happy to grant it, but my point had nothing to do with any of that. I pointed out that Paul cites uh, the Old Testament 45 times with the word Yahweh in it, and 33% uh, or 33 of those, 75%, refer to Jesus. Okay, that's what you didn't deal with when you brought up the idea that uh, our Lord is a linguistic impossibility. Uh, I disagree with you. Uh, well, find me a, a, a Yahweh text where you have the, the possessive pronoun with Yahweh. You don't, you don't have that. You I don't have any other you're points missing, in time. You're missing, you're missing the point. Mm -hmm. The Septuagint doesn't have Yahweh. It has Kurios. And you do have our kurios throughout the Septuagint. So in Greek, there's no grammatical or problem here. That, that's what I'm getting at. If you think there is, I think we need to talk about uh, Greek. I mean, to make this point to you, what you've not looked at is kirios mu. Yes, when you have a double address to God, you have got kirios mu a couple of times. However, when you have Yahweh speaking to somebody who is not Yahweh, in every occurrence, kirios mu translates Adoni. That's the most important distinction. Well, I, we're going back to Psalm 110 here, where I disagree. Well, but uh, you still haven't dealt with Psalm 68, and you haven't... No, I, conceded, I conceded all that point. I know, and everybody knows, that Yahweh texts are applied to Jesus in, in terms of second coming. Absolutely right. Well, then, uh, what you need to do... Okay, see, I, I don't understand what you've basically done here, then, uh, besides the methodological problem of making it a, a master text when uh, you've got all these problems on your hand. Messiah referred to as Adam I in verse 5. Messiah being a consistent one being referred to in the pronouns throughout the rest of the text uh, and, and not dealing with Psalm, uh, Psalm 68 and its application to Jesus in Ephesians 4. But uh, 
you, you, not a problem. You know, my, 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 my other point here is that what you're basically saying is there's no way that the Bible could ever communicate that Jesus is Yahweh, because any time that it says he's Yahweh, you're just going to say, I can see the point, but he's not Yahweh. Is he Yahweh or is he not Yahweh? And if he is Yahweh, how would the text make that, that statement? How would it prove about that? Two Yahwehs, which for me violates the first commandment. I, I disagree that Jews were other than unitary monotheists. So to say Yahweh is one person, you don't have to say unitary monotheism in Greek or Hebrew. You don't have to say millennium means a thousand years. We know that. However, I will give you these quotations. Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics. Abraham, Moses, and Elijah were all equally zealous monotheists in none of their successes was there any retrogression from the highest and purest form of unitarian belief hastings encyclopedia of religion and ethics mark's point about sorry D D uh, dennis needham says Nina, Ninem, sorry dennis Ninem came and says that they didn't recite the shema anymore why because it wasn't trinitarian leonard hodgson the monotheism of the jews was then as it still is unitarian lecturing on the trinity you can deal with these men the jewish encyclopedia judaism has always been rigorously unitarian emil brunner judaism is unitarian on that i rest my case i don't think you're right to say the jews ever believed in the trinity okay uh thank you for citing those men you said i can you can i can uh, wrestle with those men the great thing is I, I don't have to wrestle with those men because I have great texts, inspired texts, texts that I'm obligated as a believer in Christ to submit to. Yep. Tell me unequivocally, undeniably that Jesus is Adonai. Text I submit that you haven't adequately dealt with, other than to say, uh, oh yeah, yeah, of course he's called Yahweh, or of course he's called Adonai. We grant that, but it means nothing. I don't think they mean nothing. I think that they mean everything, and I think our entire salvation hinges upon us taking them at, uh, as meaning something and believing them and resting on them. I understand that so, entirely, but how many Yahwehs are you proposing? I'm only proposing young, one Yahweh who exists in three persons. But now, uh, to you said well, something. Apparently Jesus is Yahweh. Wait a minute, I must understand you. You're saying Jesus is Yahweh, you're saying the Father is Yahweh, and you're telling me that's one Yahweh. That's right. One God who exists in three persons. No, but no, 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 hang on. Wait a minute. You're saying Jesus is Yahweh. Yes, I am. And you're saying the Father is Yahweh. Right. This shouldn't be so difficult. It that's very difficult it. because even James uh, White says uh, that is nonsense. One X. Uh, James, James White does not say that is nonsense, but let's let's deal with each other since James is not here. But you, you made the statement, and this will help us see uh, whether I, I'm making sense or not. You made the statement that uh, uh, 11,000 times the word God is used in the Bible. You said, I challenge you to provide one of those 11,000 times where that word is used to refer to more than one person. That was, that's essentially uh, a quote from you. And so I, I'll give you a happily uh, just such a, a, a text where it does that. Mm -hmm. In Isaiah 45, 23, Yahweh says, the Lord God says, every knee shall bow to me and confess that I uh, am Lord. That text is applied in the New Testament to the Father and to the Son. It's applied to the Son in Philippians 2, and it's applied to the Father in Romans 14. So here we have a clear example of the term God being used to refer to more than one person. Uh, and we must remember, now Now, now I'm going to do uh, play your game here, and again, I don't mean that disrespectfully. Uh, we must remember uh, that uh, the Jews were not uh, Unitarians, they were monotheists. They, they didn't think in terms of Unitarian categories, as Jewish scholars, actual Jewish scholars point out, not the people you quoted, actual Jewish scholars like Alan Siegel and Daniel Boyering. Uh, these scholars point out that pre-Christian Jews believed that more than one person could be referred to and was, in fact, uh, Yahweh. So when we, we come to a text like Isaiah 45, 23, and we see New Testament authors applying it to more than one person, we see very clearly that these, uh, these Jews were thinking along the same lines as other Jews in their day who believed that more than one person was Yahweh. Now, just to add on here real quickly, and then I think I should uh, relinquish the mic and let other Absolutely. people no, That's a good point. Uh, you, you have raised a good point there. I just want to add, add this point to it. Uh, and that is that uh, when the uh, people in the New Testament, such as the religious leaders, when they're condemning Jesus, when they condemn Jesus for claiming to be the Son of God, they don't condemn him because he thinks that God has a divine son. They condemn him for thinking that he is the son. Okay, so in Mark 14, for example, when Jesus uh, replies categorically to the high priest question, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? When Jesus says, I am, ego, 
and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming on the clouds of heaven. Uh, they don't accuse him of, uh, they don't say that the blasphemy is that Jesus said there are two persons uh, who are God, who are divine persons. They accuse him for blasphemy because he claims to be that second person. Uh, and so uh, I'll be interested, I'll let you uh, respond to that, and then I'm going to relinquish the uh, floor to other people so they can uh, chat with you. Um, yep, thanks very much. You raised a good point about the uh, Philippians passage, of course. However, when you Tells out the I am thing. Of course, it means I am he. First occurrence in John for the woman is talking about Messiah. And he says, I'm the Messiah. This is a standard code word for I am the Messiah, not I'm God. I disagree with you fundamentally on Judaism. I don't think that all these encyclopedias or my good colleague at Oxford as Regis Professor of Divinity, was he so wrong when he says that Judaism was Unitarian? Was Dr. Harold O.J. Brown in his book on heresies so wrong to say that Jews were not Trinitarians and that a vast difference occurred when the church became Trinitarian. That's the much more interesting fact than some of the detail on Adonai, Adonai, if you like, but that needs to be examined very carefully. I, I don't think the rabbis will agree with you that Jews were other than Unitarian, monotheistic, I mean, strict Unitarian. James Dunn says that, Hurtado, Balcom, they all agree with me that Jews were not Trinitarians. That's the point you're going to have to deal with for us. 